Actually, I want to pick up on the, the last point that Rassigan made, so I appreciate you for um, drawing that up. I just want to pause and think a little bit about what we mean by sustainable development and social inclusion. And I want to argue that at heart, they're about social justice. And then I want to move on and uh, think about to what extent innovation studies has, uh, is really addressing social justice in its research and in its advice to policy. And I want to suggest that perhaps we could do it a little bit better, and in doing that, turn to political science. So a similar point to what Appy was making in a session yesterday. Um, and then conclude by pointing out that this is not news. People have been trying to do that for a long time. So as well as perhaps extending our interdisciplinarity into political science more, also to extend it historically and learn from attempts to do this over the last 40 years and more. So beginning with um, sustainable development, I think a good place to start is probably with the World Commission on Environment and Development, who reported in 1987, also known as the Brundtland Report, who coined the popular understanding of sustainable development, which is ge development that meets the needs of the present ge generation, but without undermining the needs of future generations to meet their needs. This is what Rassigan was uh, uh, um, alluding to in his, uh, the end of his talk. And I think that fundamentally begs questions of intergenerational justice. How, what are the options we need to keep open for future generations? You know, what, what kind of development's good now? And what, what, how do we know what future generations want and what's good for them? So we really need to interrogate that, this idea of intergenerational justice. But the, the, the report, the Brundtland report, went on to define needs as, uh, that, that this definition contain two notions. The first of needs, and it stated that overriding priority should be given to the, to the needs of the world's poor. Okay, so there's a distributional justice issue there at the heart of their definition. And they also talked about limits. So the ecological limits, respecting ecological and global limits, given the current state of organisation, social organisation and technology. I'll come back to limits at the end if I have time. But if you like, there's two senses of social justice in sustainable development, and it's intergenerational justice and the distributive, questions of distributive justice. Now, the literature on social inclusion is really about affirmative action to reduce and eliminate social exclusion. And that's about giving people the rights, the opportunities, the resources and the capabilities to participate fully in economic, social, political and cultural life. So I'd argue that there's a sense of procedural justice, your ability to participate, to have your voice heard, to count in the decisions that are made. So as well as just participating in economic activity, to actually shape the rules of the economic game as well would be one example. Okay? But also, there's a notion of cognitive justice. There's a presentation by Valeria Arza yesterday about indigenous knowledge and its exploitation and appropriation. And there are questions about whose knowledges count. And Shiv Visvanathan has written about these ideas of cognitive justice and what roles different knowledge bases play in, uh, in development. Now, okay, so, there, so we've got intergenerational justice, distributive justice, procedural justice, and questions within that of cognitive justice. Before moving to how innovation for inclusive, sustainable development, what that might look like, I think it's worth pausing and thinking about, actually, there's a lot of innovation that's socially exclusive and deeply unsustainable, and we need to think about how we regulate that and prevent it from happening and perhaps uh, declining forms of innovation activity that are harmful in those respects. But I won't develop that. Um, leave that for another time or for others to think about. But when it comes to our innovation studies literature, you know, there's been incredible progress on understanding innovation processes and their consequences. But largely, as Anan alluded to, they've been developed in settings that at heart have been about rent-seeking firms in markets, globalizing markets, interacting with formal knowledge institutions to develop new products and processes. And we have these innovation systems context to understand how flows of goods, services, and process innovations develop and change. And we recommend policies um, to a, uh, what we presume to be a quite rational and singular policy process that will listen to us. But anyway, we recommend policies about how to make them innovation systems contribute more to competitiveness, to profit, and to GDP growth. 
So the sort of social justice angles, I think, are actually, in, this is, I'm talking about sort of the mainstream of innovation studies, if you like, is, is largely implicit and limited to questions of distributive justice. I'm not sure we're doing so well in a lot of work or on questions of intergenerational, procedural, and cognitive justice. And I think that's recognised. I mean, this conference has been fantastic for, for, um, for really kind of um, bringing those questions to the foreground, I think. And there's much work to be done uh, to develop that. Now, when we think about some of the, some of the um, discussions here and some of the settings where perhaps more inclusive and sustainable innovation is emerging from, um, they tend to be in areas where market demand is weak, where actually the goals are much more contested. You know, sustainability is an inherently contested concept. There are in inherent trade-offs, not just between economic environment and social, but within them as well. Um, and so the sort of innovation processes are going to be more challenging challenged and contested as well, I think. And what the Steps Manifesto work, I think, has done is suggest some areas for action where those contests can be deliberated upon and settled, if you like, or, or, and, and reflected upon. But I think how to do it within them is, is I think, we're struggling with. And that's where I want to suggest perhaps we can learn from political science, where questions of social justice have been thought about and principles have been developed and argued about, differing ones, for a very long time, where process issues of accountability have been considered an authority as well. And within that, I mean, interesting, there's some, some really fantastic work around network governance where with these dynamic networks, like we see in innovation processes, lines of accounts, traditional formal lines of accountability become blurred. And, and, and lost in the dynamics and interdependencies of networks. And that's where there's lots of interesting work in democratic theory being developed. So moving away from ideas of conventional, traditional ideas around representative democracy to questions of participatory democracy and deliberative democracy. And I think interestingly as well, given that these things are shot through with power relations, questions that there's an literature on radical democracy as well and how we get down with democracy in systems where there are unequal power relations and, and, um, and um, subjugation. So I think we can learn a lot from our colleagues in political science, and obviously people in, in, in the room today are, are engaging in that and doing that. Um, similarly with power and the various theories and dimensions to power, we can get, learn a lot of, from that. Now, the, the, in doing that, we need to be careful, I think, because obviously this literature's developed through the study and in relation to political systems, not innovation systems. So there needs to be lots of careful translation and dialogue for us to do that. But I think the, the prize, if you like, is I think really getting some deep insights into what inclusive and sustainable innovation might look like. Now I'm going to finish by playing to the audience, if you like, I think. This isn't new. Um, and I mentioned, actually, I mentioned at the start the, 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 the limits aspect of... Um, the, the Brundtland definition for sustainable development. And this will come up in Rio as well, and all sorts of proprietary documents are kind of going back even further. I mean, it's 40 years since we had the Limits to Growth report from the Club of Rome, these industrialists from Europe and the US extrapolating trends uh, from, from current patterns of development and worrying about the biophysical limits of the world. And they are very real, I think. Innovation can stretch those limits, it can reshape them, it can redefine them. But ultimately, I think we have to face up to biophysical limits. But what a team here in Argentina did around Emilcar Herrera and the Fundación Bariloche is, is they said, well, let's start by, rather than extrapolating, let's think about a world where there is, is highly socially inclusive, where social justice is, is at the heart of technology development and innovation, and where participation is high. So they came up with this... Um, catastrophe or new society, a Latin American world model. And they, they, they ran their model on the basis of where they wanted to be, not where we are now, and to see if the biophysical limits would handle it. And they, they found it was okay, it could. I mean, you, we can quibble with the modeling and debate that. I mean, that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is here was a team of researchers um, that 
focused on the socio-political dimensions of innovation and what it could deliver for us. And so I think the real limits currently are socio-political, not biophysical. And so as well as looking to political science and what we can learn from that, I think we need to look back to our predecessors, if you like, and colleagues, and learn, learn from history as well. Okay.